Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this Mercer Investment webinar. Uh, we're excited actually to recommence our uh, investment webinar series. It's something that we started actually in the thick of the COVID crisis uh, towards the end of the first quarter and in Q2 uh, of 2020, and uh, it was very favorably received. So we ended up rolling it through to the end of 2020 and broadened out the, the topics. Uh, we did take a little bit of a break through the start of this year as we had the Global Investment Forum as our main piece of client communication, but we're, we're thrilled to be recommencing this series today. Uh, I wanted to start with an acknowledgement of country uh, and also an acknowledgement that it is National Reconciliation Week in Australia this week. And so that's a really important time for us to stop and reflect on the importance of reconciliation. Uh, and importantly, I wanted to take time to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which I am on today. That's the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, but to also all of the traditional owners of the lands around Australia and, of course, around the world. Um, and I attended earlier this week a lunch and learn on doing an acknowledgement of country and some of our Indigenous colleagues were also saying that it's nice, you know, to have an acknowledgement of all cultures. Uh, and so we certainly do that. And in particular, kia ora to all of our New Zealand audience. We always get very strong representation from across the Tasman uh, and we're thrilled for your support and that you're able to join us today. And finally, a shout out to everyone down in Melbourne. I know you're doing it tough entering your second week of lockdown. Um, we hope that you're doing okay, that you're looking after yourselves and hopefully this uh, lockdown doesn't have to last too much, too much longer. Uh, just to introduce our topics for to, or our speakers and our topics for today, we've got a pretty jam-packed agenda and we do try to frame this agenda up based on what we know is interesting to our clients and our stakeholders at the time. So first up, we're going to have Guion Moore, our Head of Investment Strategy, take us through a bit of a look at the macroeconomic backdrop and where we are in the um, COVID recovery from an economic and market perspective. Uh, then we've got Brian Kearney joining us from across the, the Tasman. And Brian is Head of Investment Solutions in New Zealand. And he's going to take a look at crypto mania. Do we, as institutional investors, do we buy into it or do we just watch from the sidelines? And then finally, we've got Gillian Reed, who's a responsible investment uh, senior consultant for us in the Pacific. And um, Gillian's going to take a look at the journey to net zero for your investment portfolio or super fund. Uh, we will have time for Q&A at the end. So I would encourage you, if you do have questions, you can submit them at any time. Uh, using the little Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen or the top, depending on what kind of your, uh, device you're on. But if you use that Q&A function, we will come back and I'll pick up those questions at the end and make sure that we get them answered for you. Uh, but with that, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Guion, uh, who's going to uh, look at the market backdrop. Thanks, Guion. Thank you very much, Carly. Now, I might just start by checking that the sound's coming through clearly. Can my, Carly, can you hear me? Yes, I've got you, Guion. Perfect, perfect. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, if we could just skip straight on to the next slide. Um, maybe the tech. Anyway, so um, I'm just going to give a very high level overview of how we're thinking about the global economy and the outlook of financial markets at the moment. Uh, so obviously the pandemic is continuing and in many ways is um, stronger in terms of new cases than it has been um, when we, uh, than it was when we last spoke uh, almost a year ago. Um, and the global vaccine rollout continues to gather pace. Um, and um, our thoughts go out, obviously, to our colleagues and, uh, and friends in Melbourne who are currently as it were, stuck at home. Um, but despite all of that, financial markets are now looking forward to a world after the pandemic and starting to try and anticipate the character of the ongoing recovery and the potential risks to it. Uh, the good news is that um, easy monetary policy and the huge fiscal stimulus around the world has been powering global growth. Um, we should be expecting around 7% GDP growth in the US this year, 9% uh, in China, 
little more modest at 5% in, um, in Australia. And we saw some very strong GDP numbers um, uh, yesterday in Australia, and maybe 4% in New Zealand. And it's a similar story. It's right across the world with particular local characteristics. Um, so at this stage, growth doesn't seem to be a concern. The issues that are worrying markets are um, how serious is the risk of inflation? Um, how transitory will any inflation spike be and how much of it will persist? Um, and to what degree will it spread? Um, to what degree will central banks tolerate a higher inflation environment before acting to remove accommodative monetary policy? And secondly, what is the outlook for equity markets? Um, there's been a huge rally since the March 2020 lows. Um, valuations are high, at least compared to historical averages. How far has it got to go and how long will it go on for? Now, I don't have uh, definitive answers for, for any of those questions. And within Mercer, there's quite an active and lively debate about all the topics. However, if I had to pick a most probable outcome for 12 months from now, it would be that core inflation across the developed world would be somewhere between 2 to 3%, and equity markets would be about 10% higher than they are today. Obviously, that comes with uncertainty, but overall, we still think we're in quite a favourable risk-on investment environment. Now, to begin with, let's address the inflation question. Um, the re oh, back a slide. Um, the recent pickup in inflation in the US, as you can see by the, uh, the blue line on the leftmost chart, um, has been substantially but not exclusively a US phenomenon. Um, and there are good reasons to think, that it, to think that it will be, as the central bank would say, transitory, although transitory could mean you know, a number of months, six months or so to pass through the system, depending on the pace of the return to a normal economic environment. Um, and it's really occurred because of the intersection of a number of different factors. Um, we had the base effect coming through. So obviously prices fell March last year, and then we measured a big step up um, when measuring year on year to March this year. Uh, we had a huge cash loaded stimulus in the US, and that's been spent on lots of used cars, hotel rooms, airline flights. There are millions of furloughed workers who are currently receiving income support and so there's some you know, tightness in the labour market at the moment. That's meant to continue until the beginning of September. Um, and of course, as things we all know, were the um, pandemic-related uh, supply chain disruptions, which we will, which we sort of anticipate uh, working its way through the system over a period of time. Uh, overall, markets seem to share the view of the US Federal Reserve um, that the inflation shock will be transitory. Um, if we look at inflation swaps, the tool that financial markets use for pricing inflation risk, we see headline risk, headline CPI um, uh, for the US over the next 12 months been about 3.6% before falling back to 2.5% the following year. Um, and, but for most other geographies, there's any, barely any sign of an inflation spike anticipated at all. Um, that includes Australia. Um, the, on one hand, um, uh, this is reassuring, um, but also maybe a concern. Maybe markets are complacent. Um, the challenge is that if inflation does pick up, then central banks, and particularly the US Federal Reserve, will have to accelerate the planned normalisation of monetary policy with the consequences for, for financial markets. Which brings us to equity markets. It's been an extraordinary 12 months uh, with huge equity returns. Um, and we're unlikely to see such strong returns repeated, but there's still quite a lot of cause for optimism. Almost all markets are expecting double-digit earnings growth over the next year. This is to be expected at this stage of the recovery, and given the degree of deficit spending undertaken by governments, it's even more so for this recovery. Um, so while the earnings outlook is strong, equity markets should be fairly robust, and we've seen this in the price action over recent months. Rise in long-term interest rates has been one of optimism and growth and hasn't endangered the equity rally. Uh, even the recent inflation surprise only caused a pause in the rally and a dash of volatility. Can we move on to the next slide? Um, so the outlook is reasonably optimistic, but not one without risks. Um, things that I'm particularly paying attention to are employment markets and commodities. Um, one data point I've been tracking closely is the um, Atlanta Fed wage growth tracker. It's US data. Um, uh, it has the advantage of coming out monthly um, and in a fairly timely fashion. 
uh, Australian macroeconomic data can be uh, slow and late, um, unfortunately. And also, it's been quite stable through the crisis period. A lot of macroeconomic data has been, as it were, unusably volatile. Um, whereas this one has been a, a pretty good indicator about what's going on in the underlying economy. Um, normally, we would expect to see the pace of wage growth slow quite substantially in the recovery phase of the business cycle. And we saw that coming out of the past two recessions. Uh, lots of unemployed people limiting wage rises. Um, this trend tends to be quite supportive of equity markets because it means that the benefits of strong economic growth flow most strongly through to corporate profits, through to earnings. Uh, however, it could be different this time, given the huge policy support. There are many anecdotal reports in the US of companies finding it difficult to hire workers at the moment. Uh, and in Australia, the, um, the unemployment rate has been coming down very rapidly as well. It's been one of the great surprises of this business cycle. Um, if wage growth starts to remain stable or even rise, that will start to eat into profits and will add momentum to any inflationary pressure and bring closer to the day when we start to see some kind of normalisation of monetary policy and present a more challenging environment for equity returns. Um, I've also been watching commodity prices, another potential source of inflation, so obviously commodity prices have gone up, most commodity prices have gone up quite substantially since the lows of March last year, but are still you know, reasonably priced compared to historical averages. I particularly pay attention to copper, which has always been a good measure of the, um, of the state of the economy and is key um, as, part, as we start to build the infrastructure um, of a, uh, you know, a net zero economy. Um, my colleague Gillian Reed will be speaking a little bit about this later. Um, I pay attention to oil. Um, it's for the, uh, at this stage, still the driving force of the economy, of the energy of the economy, as it were. There's been um, a meaningful underinvestment in that sector, and it may be susceptible to um, a spike up if the uh, recovery uh, continues in its current strength. Um, gold is always a good measure of inflation anxiety. Um, and then there's a digital gold, as some call it, Bitcoin, which you can see disappearing off the, um, off the top of the slide there. Um, my colleague Brian Kearney will be talking a little bit more about that later, and he's a real expert on that. Um, and I, I had a joke about coffee prices, but I think I'm running a bit short on time to tell it. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Maybe my laptop's not updating. It, um, you may be able to see the next slide. Um, uh, looking beyond the short term um, and uh, trying to have an idea of what's going to drive the recovery longer term. Uh, for the recovery to turn into a self-sustaining expansion, we need to see a pickup in business investment. Um, I actually can't see the slide. I hope that you can. Um, but what it shows, um, the, what it shows is capital goods orders in the US. Sorry, US statistics again. Um, this is a measure of the degree of business investment that's occurring. And it shows the same piece of data in two different ways, one in dollar terms and one as a percentage of GDP. Um, when the data came out earlier this week, um, it was reported as being the highest level of capital goods orders um, uh, ever, which is true in dollar terms, but as a percentage of GDP, business investment in the US, in Australia, and more generally across the developed world, has been declining for years. And it's arguably the case that this phenomenon lies at the real heart of the low for long environment of weak GDP growth, weak productivity growth, low wage growth that we've been stuck in for the past few decades. For recovery to really take hold and lift us out of the low for long environment, we need to see business investment continue to rise and by a lot and, by, and over a prolonged period. If this occurs, it will be good for growth, good for profits, good for productivity and good for wages. And so this is a particular statistic that I'm paying attention to. Um, I'm going to wrap up there uh, and hand over to my colleague, Brian, um, who, will, uh, who will be discussing um, uh, Bitcoin. Thank you, Grant. Well, I'm pleased to have the opportunity to present on this topic today, which I'm sure will gather a wide range of views from the audience. Much of the discussion around cryptocurrency mirrors the early days of the internet with a vocal minority strongly believing that it's the way of the future, countered by a strong majority who question whether it has any value at all. 
I've personally been interested in cryptocurrency since 2017, when I moved from London to Auckland and found that cryptocurrency was the easiest and cheapest way for us to move our savings with us. However, today I'm wearing my institutional investor hat and looking to answer the question, should we include an allocation to cryptocurrency within our portfolios? Cryptocurrencies have wild price rallies and falls, the most recent of which has taken place over the last six months or so. What's made this latest rally so notable is that it's put cryptocurrency on the radar for many institutional investors. Before we explore our views, I'd like to ask for yours by way of a poll that should be coming up on screen shortly. If I can please ask you to select the statement that best reflects your views of cryptocurrency as an asset class. One, cryptocurrency is already proven as an asset class. Two, you'd buy it personally, but it's not institutional yet. Three, you'd need to see a convincing use case before investing. Or four, it's just digital tulip mania, and it's all going to come crashing down soon. It looks like we already have quite a lot of interaction there, with the majority forming on needing to see a convincing use case before investing. That's not too dissimilar to our house view. Our house view is that cryptocurrency is not currently a good investment for institutional investors. We'll explore our reservations in this session, but also cover some of the aspects that point to a positive future for cryptocurrency and the developments that we would like to see in the future. We can move on to the reservations, Dina. If anything highlights the struggle of analyzing cryptocurrency as an asset class, it's the fact that we're up a thousand percent since March last year, but questioning whether the recent pullback is the sign of a bear market. Price volatility of cryptocurrency is one of the biggest challenges for institutional investors. Experience has shown that institutional investors struggle to stay rational during normal market downturns. One can only imagine the governance budget that would be used on an asset class that has had three drawdowns of over 50% in the last four years alone. Another concern is that China currently accounts for roughly two thirds of the mining power globally. As you may have seen in the news, this is subject to very heavy scrutiny from the Chinese government. An effective clampdown on mining in China would almost certainly threaten the stability of the cryptocurrency market. This mining concentration leads to another significant challenge. Cryptocurrency uses a lot of energy. In a world where we're all focused on reducing our carbon footprint, an investment which relies on high energy as a core form of security is hard to accept. Recent estimates show that one Bitcoin transaction has the same carbon footprint of roughly 1.3 million visa transactions. And the annual power consumption of the network is comparable to that of the Netherlands. There are elements of positive news in this space, such as renewable or excess energy being used for cryptocurrency mining. But the current reality is that China dominates mining activity and coal is by far the cheapest form of energy in China. Some cryptocurrencies are looking to solve this energy issue, but that does lead us, lead us to another challenge. It's hard to predict which cryptocurrencies will survive the test of time. Bitcoin is clearly dominant, as we can see on the left-hand side of, this, of the slide. Even with all its flaws, it is seen by the market as digital gold. But who's to say that we're not actually in the digital Bronze Age and the true digital gold hasn't even been discovered yet? It's entirely possible that Bitcoin's value could go to zero while cryptocurrencies on the whole become mainstream. Other reservations worth noting are new cryptocurrencies are continuously being created. This makes the asset class an inflationary one, even though Bitcoin itself may be this deflationary. Most governments are at the early stages of regulating cryptocurrency. This is a significant risk, risk for institutional investors. The lack of cash flow or yield make it hard to value cryptocurrency using traditional investment metrics. And the short trading history means we don't really know how it will behave 
in different market environments. Now we know that all of these topics are hotly debated and have strong technical experts on either side of the arguments. To balance the scales a bit, here are a few aspects which support a positive case for cryptocurrency. We can have the next slide, Dina. Institutional interest is growing. This should bring more conventional market dynamics into play and potentially decrease the price volatility in future. Cryptocurrency is global in nature, which mirrors our new ways of working with people working remotely across borders and developing social networks online. Many cryptocurrencies other than Bitcoin can support efficient micro transactions. One can only imagine a world where our Teslas are paying for insurance while we drive or advertisers are crediting our crypto wallets while we browse the, the web with adverts on. Smart contracts, which are agreements that are locked into the blockchain itself, are very powerful. This essentially enables trustless transactions of any size. The competitive landscape of cryptocurrencies has created high incentives for some of the key talent in the world to solve the issues currently faced by cryptocurrencies. And blockchain usage outside of cryptocurrencies themselves is also growing in popularity. It's natural to assume that the use of cryptocurrencies, block-based, block, blockchain-based currencies, would grow in step. Now that we've explored some of the pros and cons, we'll come back to our stance. We can have the next slide, Dina. We don't believe that cryptocurrencies are yet suitable for institutional investment. However, I do encourage you to keep an eye on the market and think about potential triggers for change. In our view, developments that we would like to see are stable government regulation, common adoption with widespread use cases, some consensus around intrinsic value, and quite importantly, a solution to the high energy consumption of cryptocurrencies, as monitoring our investment carbon footprint is going to be vital to our collective long-term success. I'd like to now hand over to Jill, who will tell you a bit more about our pathway to a net zero economy. Thank you, Brian. Energy really does underpin all parts of our economy. So now let's look at why there's a focus on a transition to zero emissions and how MESRA is approaching this uh, in our advice and a framework to guide what next for implementation. So the key reason why uh, there is this focus is to enable a best case climate scenario to eventuate, which has the lowest physical damages. And that's in our interests as long-term investors. However, transitioning to that eventuality also presents the greatest risks and opportunities, particularly over the next decade. So that's what investors need to respond to. And that's what's being reinforced by regulators. So the Australian regulator is only recently seeking disclosure uh, on financial risk management, but the New Zealand regulations are going further and you know, looking for those emissions reductions. And that includes, for example, setting fossil fuel restrictions in the KiwiSaver funds. And there is no doubt that the stakeholder expectations from members and beneficiaries is also rising. So those reasons are reinforced by the evidence that the transition is already underway. So the technology and the price developments in renewable energy is fundamental to that move away from fossil fuels and particularly coal. Uh, markets have also begun responding in some cases, and in this example, this is Next Era, a renewables company that has now grown to the same size as a shrinking ExxonMobil. And this environment is giving governments and companies and investors the confidence to actually make policy announcements that align with a 1.5 degree scenario by targeting net zero emissions by 2050. So before we go further, we're going to take a, a short poll to see where you're at and on this net zero term in particular. So if we can go to the poll, there's three options. If you can select the statement that best represents your organization's view. So either camp one, what does net zero even mean? Two, we have made a start on climate change, but we've not yet set carbon reduction targets or three, you're already there and you're setting a carbon reduction target already. 
So I'm pleased to see, so we'll start to get these results coming through now. It's fairly evenly split between camps uh, two and three. So it's really only a relatively small percentage who are at the beginning of this journey. And there's a number uh, that have actually set carbon reduction targets already, uh, which is higher than I actually expected uh, to see. So there you go, you can see the, the polling results there now. So you know, the vast majority of people in this call at least have, have certainly made a start. Uh, and some have actually set those carbon reduction targets. But I'm going to still take the time to clarify this net zero uh, term, partly so we're all on the same page and partly to just make sure that everyone's interpretation is the same. Because the objective is to reduce emissions to zero. So that's the key. And that's in the blue. But the term net zero recognises that there are likely to be stubborn remaining emissions that are going to need netting off. And that's what the green is. And by absorbing them out of the atmosphere through nature-based solutions, so trees or soils, or technology-based solutions. So uh, absorbing out of the atmosphere and storing carbon either underground or in products. And achieving this by 2050 or sooner is consistent with the scientific advice for a 1.5 degree scenario. So carbon neutral might sound similar, but only offsets today's emissions through nature-based solutions like forestry, which is better than not doing that, but there aren't enough trees for that to be the long-term answer. And that's why it's not the scientific advice. So reducing emissions or decarbonizing our economy and our portfolios at the necessary pace is the key. So how is MRSA approaching transition or decarbonization in our advice? So we don't believe it should be immediate divestment from only fossil fuel energy, only in equities, uh, regardless of price, without factoring in future transition capacity and disregarding all other investment principles. What we are suggesting is that this should be a multi-year plan to reduce emissions in the portfolio, that an integration and an engagement-based approach should be the focus taking a total portfolio view, so including real assets in particular, still thinking about price, so particularly in the short term, uh, in the context of that strategic plan, and looking at emissions plus transition capacity plus green revenues, and still factoring in all of the traditional investment and ESG considerations. So the analysis that we're using to support this advice is captured in our analytics for climate transition tool. Just go on to the next slide, thank you. So the ACT tool is combining multiple metrics from underlying holdings, so at a, a company level or an asset level, looking across a spectrum. So the gray, the green and the in-between. So we're speaking about uh, transition capacity because emissions metrics uh, are very important, they're fundamental uh, to the objective, but there are now new metrics available on how a company is positioning for transition in the future and also what revenues are being generated from the green or the solutions end of the spectrum. And we think this focus on transition capacity from high carbon intensity, low transition capacity to the other end and everywhere in between is giving us a better way to invest in a transitioning economy rather than just selling those companies with historically high emissions. So on the next slide, we've included some output examples uh, from the ACT tool. The first one on the left is showing how for this diversified portfolio example, a small percentage of the portfolio weight, so only about 1.7% of the portfolio weight is actually driving more than a third of the carbon emissions intensity. So it's illustrative of how often a lot can be achieved with relatively small portfolio changes for many diversified investors. And then on the right hand side, another couple of examples of how this analysis can be sliced and diced. The top one is breaking uh, the results down by sector. So looking at the greys and the greens on a sector basis. Uh, utilities, for example, has very high grey, but it also has very high green. So that's an example of you know, being careful what you're selling based just on carbon emissions. 
And then at the bottom on the right hand side, the manager view also helps to prioritize uh, engagement with managers to understand why they're holding particular companies and what change might be possible in portfolios. So finally, what next for implementation? So this framework provides the high level overview for how we're recommending next steps in our advice. So the first is, and it's the same as in all strategic planning, working out where you are now and calculating the baseline. So emissions metrics in particular, but there are now lots of other metrics as I've just mentioned that can also be looked at to give you a really good sense of where you are today. The second is then analyzing the possibilities for making changes in the portfolio. And the ACT tool is being used uh, with us to support both of those steps. And for some clients, this risk and opportunities focus might be the sole priority for now. For others, this analysis is helping to inform step three, which is setting those aligned carbon reduction targets. So for example, a net zero by 2050 uh, target with a 2030 milestone is the typical focus at the moment. And then implementation plans are adopting the same four steps that we would uh, typically refer to. So integration, so making sure that this climate change and this transition lens in particular uh, is captured within strategic asset allocation and portfolio decisions. Uh, active ownership is all about encouraging companies and policymakers through engagement conversations, uh, voting, to act in line with investor best interests and timeframes. The third is about investing in those transition solutions. So this should present opportunities uh, in their own right, you know, right throughout the value chain and all the different kinds of solutions that we need, but it should also assist other portfolio companies to transition more successfully. And lastly, screening, uh, primarily used to monitor those high carbon exposures, particularly where there's low transition capacity. And that could inform integration and engagement steps, but for some clients, it might also lead to setting some high carbon restrictions. So implementing all of the above we expect is going to involve asset owners and asset managers working closely together on how portfolios could change. But in our experience and the work that we've done so far in this, we're confident that there are a lot of opportunities for investors to position well for transition and continue to deliver on investment objectives. So with that, I will pass back to Kylie. Thanks, Jill, and thank you to all of our speakers. Um, I am aware we might have had some technical glitches in there. I'm going to blame the Wi-Fi. Uh, gods for that. Um, hopefully we're okay. But if I happen to, to glitch out, I might uh, perhaps lean on you, Guion, to see if you can moderate through the rest of the Q&A. Hopefully we're okay. Um, just, just rounding out from Jill's presentation, I, I should say that for the uh, Mercer funds in Australia, we've leveraged very heavily on the type of uh, thinking and analysis that Jill's just talked about um, to support uh, a commitment for the Mercer funds in Australia, including for the Mercer Super Trust uh, to achieve net zero by 2050. Uh, and I think, you know, we've, I've personally found this analysis very uh, helpful in being able to frame up the case that making that kind of commitment is expected to be in the best interests of members over the long term, but also to give us a sense of what that transition pathway might look like recognizing that it is not something that you can do overnight it is going to take time uh, and we need to do it in a measured fashion um, i also wanted to say that if you are interested in climate change and financial risk and in particular the new guidance that has come out from apra um, we do have a webinar that's uh, specifically focused on the apra guidance um, around uh, climate change as a financial risk. That is next Thursday, the 6th of June at 2 p.m. Uh, the content of it is tailored more for APRA regulated entities, although we are aware that there are a number of non-regulated entities that tend to fo follow the spirit of the regulations anyway. So uh, anyone is welcome to join that's interested in that topic. Uh, there will be a follow-up email to this webinar and we'll include in there the link for how you register for that climate change 
webinar or just reach out to your MESA contact and I'm sure we can get you the registration uh, details. Now, um, we do have uh, a little bit of time for Q&A. So if you do have a question, uh, please pop it um, in the Q&A function. So we do have one here and Jill, it is for you. Uh, and it says, uh, isn't it also critical to specify benchmarks on net zero uh, specifically around scope one and two versus scope three? Yes, yeah, so the headline number is the easy part. The, the net zero by 2050 is not the hard part. It's then being quite, you need to get, then get really quite specific about certainly those nearer term milestones to give credibility to that longer term target. But yes, getting specific about where are you starting from? So is the baseline from 2019, 2020, uh, what is being captured in the target? Is it all assets? Is it some asset classes? And what is the objective? So it's a reduction by how much? And is it, yes, scope one and two is generally acceptable at the moment with a move to capture scope three. In some asset classes, that's easier than others, but certainly looking at the sector basis on scope three, at least, but looking at, is it uh, relative? Is it uh, carbon intensity? Is it absolute? Is it just carbon? Is it greenhouse gases? So this is certainly an area that uh, we have some good understanding of now and some consistency, but it will continue to evolve, I think, for sure. Thanks, Jill. Um, Guion, there is one here for you and always tricky when you give uh, a sort of near-term forecast around equities. And of course, there are other scenarios around that. So it's saying your base case for equities, 10% uh, or higher, what's, you know, what, what's the risk around that, I think, is the question. What's the yeah. probability of a 10 to 20% fall? And I might, there's a two-barrel question there, but I might stick to the first part of it so that um, we can get to some of the other questions as well. Yeah, well, I mean, it's... Um... I wouldn't say it's a base case. What it is, is we're saying is that we still think we're pretty optimistic on equity. So it's not that we're going to get 20 or, as we saw in the US last year, 60% um, returns, um, but rather we're going to get pretty strong returns, probably returns that are not radically different from the kind of assumptions that go into your strategic asset allocation when you're doing your, um, setting your portfolio construction for your super funds. Um, so around 10%, maybe 8%, maybe 12%, maybe 6%. Um, I would typically think that, um, that it has a volatility in the region of 15 to 20% around that. Um, so you might, you know, in a worst case outcome, I imagine that we might experience over the course of the year a 30% drawdown. Um, but um, I personally, personally feel that that's unlikely at the moment. Okay, thanks, Guion. Um, Brian, I'm going to come to you. Um, and there's a question here. So you've talked about the cryptocurrencies themselves um, and that we don't consider them investable. I think your answer is going to be similar here, but the question is really asking about um, the crypto funds. Would we view them any differently to investing directly uh, in the currencies themselves? Probably not at this stage, um, because essentially the, the underlying exposure still has the same risks and, and those reservations that we noted would still hold. But um, the likely evolution is going to be one of, you know, a very small allocation through, let's say, hedge fund exposure or something like that. Um, I can imagine that if the use case for cryptocurrency as an inflation hedge does uh, evolve, then we can imagine a lot of multi-asset strategies would, um, would have them at the moment, not a dedicated allocation, either direct or via a fund manager. Yeah, agreed on that. Um, Guyan, I'm going to come back to you. So firstly, there's a comment. Um, thank you for the succinct presentation. So we'll take that. Thank you. Um, it says, I note that long-term investment as a percentage of GDP has been in decline since 2012. Does this reflect a reorientation of economies from primary production to more service industries? Um, yeah, so there's a variety of statistics on this. <clears throat> um, I believe that total or net after depreciation investment across the whole world, including, including China, has been in decline for um, two to three decades now. Um, and now that's as a percentage of GDP, not necessarily in dollar terms. The exact reasons for that is not a well settled topic. Um, part of it is you know, the economy is so big and incrementally adding new investments on top becomes progressively harder. Um, part of it has been simply 
the um, availability of com compelling um, investment opportunities. Within the West itself, um, it's been more pronounced, of course, and that's in, in part um, this transition from um, you know, uh, uh, manufactured goods to services. Um, in terms of um, will it reverse, um, maybe, maybe the climate transition will be the thing that leads to that reversal. Um, and uh, there has been some signs that that may be the case um, coming out of the US, particularly with the Biden's government to try and support the infrastructure required to implement a, a, a net zero target. Thanks, um, Guyan. Jill, I'm going to come back to you. And it, this is sort of a question around the role of government in supporting the net zero transition. I mean, I think we would say that, you know, there's a crucial role that all players uh, have to play across government and investors and corporate um, to get us to where we, we need to go, individuals, of course. Um, but maybe you can just talk a little bit around, you know, what we're seeing perhaps around the world, because there's very big regional differences uh, from a policy perspective um, in support of net zero. So are you able to elaborate on that a little? Yeah, I think you've set that up well. There is definitely a certain amount we can do as investors or, or as corporates, but it's not going to be the whole story. There is going to need to be a role. And it will be very interesting to see what comes out of uh, COP26, which is the big climate change, global climate change meeting in November this year. Uh, but certainly Biden and the Climate Leaders Summit would suggest that we're being well positioned for that. And certainly what's happening in Europe is significant. So compare, the APRA guidance is important in Australia, but compared to what's going on in Europe at the moment, this is, you know, it's not a strong position what's happening in Europe when it comes to finance and the, the policy position and that regulation and encouragement of what's happening with finance is really very significant. Uh, so th I think... And when you look at that UN Race to Zero campaign, which is really what's tracking, you know, these net zero commitments that are coming at all levels of government. So in Australia, we might focus on what our federal government isn't doing, but when, as soon as you take that to a state or a local level, there is significant action happening at a government level. So it is definitely varying, not just at a federal level, but also if you need to look at really at all levels of government. And that is certainly going to play out particularly longer term. So there's quite a lot we can do at the moment in, in equities in particular and global equities, but it will be important in an Australian context, uh, but also sovereign bonds. We were looking at that this morning for a New Zealand client and the role of government when it comes to our sovereignty exposures is going to be, is going to be important. Okay, thank you. Um, I might just go one last one and a, and a quick answer because we're going to head up against time. Brian, there's a question here. Someone's sort of referring to, you know, the very strong outperformance from crypto and alluding to the fact that it might have some diversification benefit and sort of questioning is, is, a, is a zero exposure the right the, the right place to be. So, I, you know, I, I, I think you've been reasonably clear that, you know, we see more risks than, than rewards there, but I just wondered whether you had any other uh, comments to make in, in reference to that particular question. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question because the question is, should we have a small allocation given there are some positives, um, but it comes down to that governance budget um, issue is if an allocation that's small enough to not uh, heavily outweigh your, your risk metrics is probably going to have a disproportionate amount of time at the board. Um, some of these issues, once they're ironed out, will mean that um, you know the, the governance budget is, is more aligned with, with the risk. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much to all of our speakers. There's some uh, very topical issues we've touched on today, and I think you've done a great job of covering them. Um, so as you leave today, you will get a short uh, exit survey, just really um, looking for your feedback on whether this is hitting the mark for you. But um, more importantly, let us know the kind of things you'd like to hear about, because we do want to make these forums relevant and interesting. So we absolutely look to that feedback to frame up future agendas. Um, so with that, I will let everybody go within the 45 minutes and we will hope to see you next time. Thanks very much.